All right. Uh, tonight, Franz Kafka, wonderful, and this is our uh, passage. Um, well, I'll talk about this in a minute. You may not have heard this from Kafka. There's lots to know about Kafka, maybe to remember, but this is one of my favorite parables. Leopards break into the temple and drink to the dregs what is in the sacrificial pic pictures. This is repeated over and over again. Finally, it can be calculated in advance, and it becomes a part of the ceremony. Parables and paradoxes. All right, so let's do context. We do the passage, we do context, and then we find our way to wisdom through the text. Um, there is Franz Kafka. There is dates, July 3rd, 1883 to June 3rd, 1924. Uh, born in Prague. Um, in what is now the Czech Republic, but was then Bohemia. Um, upper middle, middle class Jewish family, um, but uh, not necessarily happy, <laughs> um, because money, as you know, doesn't make you happy. Neither does love, by the way, but that's another lecture. <laughs> uh, really interesting and tragic story. Um, his two younger brothers, uh, George and Heinrich died in infancy by the time Kafka was six. And um, he was the only son then in, in the family that included three daughters. And the three daughters would later die in a Polish ghetto during the Holocaust. Uh, he had a difficult relationship with, with both his parents, but especially his father. And, uh, you know, you can see that coming through. I don't like to psychoanalyze authors too much. It's a little too easy. And it ends up being more about you than the author sometimes. So, But, you know, we cannot doubt that his father is a figure in many of his works. Uh, because he was so dismissive of his son. Um, didn't think he was um, worth much. Um, kind of um, pushed his mother around. Um, very successful businessman. So I think there's, we know this story, right? The, the father figure who's successful in business and his child becomes an artist and he can't understand it. Uh, and then in Kafka's case, um, well, he, the father became a kind of tyrant so, following his father, uh, Kafka goes and completes a law degree in 1906 and works at a, as an intern in a, uh, at a law clerk in a law office. Um, yeah, <laughs> we have the best board. Uh, so, our board chairman today, he and I were exchanging emails, and he's an insurance guy, among other things. And so, he... I said, okay, and now I've got to get back to Kafka. And he said, did you know Kafka was in, sh in insurance? And I said, yes. And he said, did you know that the insurance company he worked for ended up being the third largest insurance company in the world? And I said, I did not know that. Uh, we did not get that in literary criticism of Franz <laughs> Kafka. He hated it. Kafka hated it. You know, he was not suited for it. Maybe you know how he felt if you're in a job that doesn't release your, or nurture your creative potential. Um, he, um, he did it because he wanted to get his father off his back. Um, but then he found himself at this last company, the one that became so large. Um, they actually liked him because he kind of was not harassed too much. And so he just kind of did his work. He was that kind of guy you know, who wasn't pleased doing this kind of menial, not menial, but boring to him work, but he kind of just got through it and they appreciated him for that. He was a very popular employee, in fact, and socialized well, uh, it is said. Um, twice he was engaged to marry Felice Bauer before the two finally went their separate ways in 1917. Um, he later fell in love with a woman named Dora Diamond, and who was Jewish and a socialist like him. Um, 
they, uh, at this time, Kafka's health is starting to fail him. And so this love affair is kind of happens under that cloud. He has tuberculosis and uh, clearly not well, but the relationship continues. They actually move together to Berlin. But I don't know if you've ever been with anyone with a chronic illness, but it becomes a third person in the relationship, a third figure in the relationship, and that's what happened with Kafka. Um, he suffered all kinds of ailments, migraines, boils, depression, anxiety, insomnia. Uh, eventually, they, he and Dora returned to Prague, and uh, they travel from there to Vienna for treatment at a sanatorium. And so that's where he died in, uh, on June 3rd, 1924 in Austria, uh, and ended up being buried beside his parents back in Prague. Yeah, which was, I thought that was interesting too. All right, so, by the way, these are his drawings, which I think are fascinating, that, I'll, that will be in all the slides tonight. So you know this one, right? 1915, The Metamorphosis. So uh, I have such a good staff that uh, Sharon uh, reads my slides first, and she said, you got the publication date wrong, and I said, you're right, except that this is not the publication date, this is the author date. And you'll see why that is in a minute, you may already know, that the writing happened a long time before the publication. Um, so the metamorphosis we're actually going to spend a little time on tonight because we kind of have to. 1916, The Judgment, 1919, in the Penal Colony, in the Country Doctor. So I just want to look at that, look at that production. Now, these are short stories, but if you know them, they are incredibly dense short stories. Uh, in the Penal Colony is a brutal story about um, a man who's incarcerated, well, people, men who are incarcerated in a penal colony, whose crimes are cut into their backs by a machine. Yeah, the country doctor is, I don't even know how to describe it, except it's some sort of nightmare that he wrote down. It's, uh, you can't understand the country doctor unless you see it as a dream, because it, it is that kind of narrative structure, which is not much of a structure at all, highly symbolic, um, very sexual, uh, all that. You may know A Hunger Artist, which was a, a collection of stories. Uh, you may have read it in high school. Um, let's see. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, here's, here's a main person in um, Kafka's life, Max Brode. We wouldn't be talking about Kafka tonight or any time without Max Brode. So um, he told Max, his friend, and his literary executor to destroy all his unpublished manuscripts, to destroy them. Brode did not obey the, the wishes of his friend. And so in 1925, he publishes The Trial which is, uh, if you know, is a dark and paranoid tale um, and the most successful novel of Kafka. The protagonist is a man named Joseph K., who's forced to defend himself in a hopeless court system against a crime that's never really revealed to him or to the reader. <laughs> so uh, it's um, very resonant with especially what would happen a few years after Kafka's death, and I don't know, maybe in 2019 even. The next year, uh, Brode releases The Castle. Uh, again, similar themes, a faceless and slightly, only slightly menacing bureaucracy. Um, this is, uh, again, the protagonist is just simply K, letter K. Uh, who tries to find the people who run his village. <laughs> uh, 1927 is America. 
protagonist is a boy named Carl Rossman who's sent by his family to live in America where uh, it's kind of a candide story if you know that. Uh, he's innocent and simple and everybody takes advantage of him. Um, lots of father issues in this work but also um, speaks to Kafka's love of travel books and memoirs. Not that he traveled that much but uh, he liked reading them. And then 1931, Max Brode publishes The Great Wall of China, uh, which again was written 14 years before. Um, of course, Kafka's le legacy of, is Kafkaesque, that scene, that feeling, that um, setting in which you don't know what's wrong and no one will tell you and you're powerless to do anything about it. Um, not surprisingly, Kafka became very influential in the 60s with communism in Eastern Europe <clears throat> and became, that's when he really takes off, in fact, among readers. And that's when we get the phrase, the adjective Kafka-esque. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about the metamorphosis, take you back to high school or college maybe, before we get into the parables. So, this is an amazing story. Uh, let me just read it. Here's the opening lines. One morning, as Gregor Samsa was waking up from anxious dreams, he discovered that in bed he had been changed into a monstrous vermin bug. <laughs> opening line. Uh, we should do a, a series on great opening lines. <laughs> Uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, right? I'm a, see, I, now I won't remember it. I'm a sick man, I'm a miserable man, I'm a sad man, and I think there's something wrong with my liver. <laughs> Call me Ishmael. Okay, I'll stop. Um, he was changed into a monstrous vermin bug. He lay on his armor hard back and saw, as he lifted his head a little, his brown arched abdomen divided up into rigid bow-like sections. From this height, the blanket, just about ready to slide off completely, could hardly stay in place. His numerous legs, pitifully thin in comparison to the rest of his circumference, flickered helplessly before his eyes. Oh God, he thought, what a demanding job I've chosen day in and day out on the road. This is the genius of the metamorphosis. The man wakes up as a roach, and all he can think about is his job. And in fact, the story is about his job. And he attributes his roachness to his job. Oh God, he thought, what a demanding job I've chosen. Day in, day out on the road. The stresses of trade are much greater than the work going on at the head office. And in addition to that, I have to deal with the problems of traveling, the worries about train connections, irregular bad food, temporarily and constantly changing human relationships which never come to the heart, to hell with it all. Because now I'm a roach. Well, he, he then goes on. He, he has two things. He's angry and he's anxious. He's anxious because he can't get to work, because he can't get out of bed, because he's a roach. And he's angry, not at being a roach, but at his job. Why was Gregor the only one condemned to work in the firm where, at the slightest lap, someone immediately attracted the greatest suspicion? Were all the employees then collectively one and all scoundrels? Was there then among them no truly devoted person who, if he failed to use just a couple hours in the morning for office work, would become abnormal from pangs of conscience and really be in no state to get out of bed? Was it really not enough to let an apprentice make inquiries if such questioning was even necessary? Must the manager himself come, and in the process must it be demonstrated to the entire innocent family that the investigation of this suspicious circum circumstance could only be entrusted to the intelligence of the manager. Why is he saying that? Because his boss comes to his apartment. Because that's what bosses do in this story world. 
Uh, it's not clear how the boss knows he's late because he's not quite late, but he's almost too late for the train. But somehow the boss knows all this. Again, this is Kafka, best not to think too much about the logic of it all. And so the manager comes and the family gets all, you know, nervous and eager to please the manager and they implore Gregor to get out of bed, which he can't do. Um, and so they eventually open the door. And the office manager warns Gregor of the consequences of missing work and mentions that, by the way, his recent work had not been especially satisfactory. He's a roach. Um, he tells through the door, he tells the manager that he'll be there shortly, but no one can understand what he says because he speaks roach now. Um, but they figure that something's probably really wrong with him. So he manages to fall out of bed, that upsets, get out of bed, but it's a fall, and that upsets everyone because they hear the thump, and he goes over and grabs the doorknob with his uh, roach mouth um, and opens the door. He begs the office manager's forgiveness for his late start. Okay, he's a roach and he's begging for forgiveness from his boss. The office manager sees him and bolts from the apartment and Gregor tries to catch up with him with his little roach feet. So this is funny too. Don't let people tell you Kafka didn't have a sense of humor. This is funny um, and tragic at the same time because his father then drives him back into the bedroom with a cane and a rolled up newspaper. Gregor hurts himself, squeezing back through the doorway and his father slams the door shut. Now his sister Greta is initially um, sympathetic to her brother's plight of being a roach. And uh, he sees that she, in fact, has put milk and bread in the room. And he's very excited because he's very hungry. He hasn't eaten. But then he doesn't like milk now. Uh, has no taste for it, even though it was one of his favorite foods. Um, so he just settles himself under a, cow under a couch in the room and just listens to the apartment. So the next morning, Greta, kind of the hero of the story, at least for a little while, sees that he's not touched the milk, so she brings him scraps, and rotting food scraps, which he happily consumes. This begins a whole routine, where the sister feeds him and cleans up his room while he hides under a couch so as not to frighten her. And he listens through the wall to his family members talking, and they are in dire financial straits because now Gregor, not only not able to work anymore, can also not provide for his family. Um, he also learns that his mother wants to come see him in his room, as a mother would, but his sister and father prevent her from doing that. So, um, Right. Gregor now can kind of move about in his body, and so he starts climbing the walls, right? Because wouldn't you do that? I would totally do that. You start climbing the walls. Um, and again, the great sister Greta figures this out, and so she moves the furniture so that he can climb around and run around and be a roach. Um, this deeply upsets Gregor because I think it's a symbol of his transformation, his metamorphosis, that he's not going back. Um, and, and I'm skipping a lot here, but um, he, in one of the cleaning times, um, Gregor gets out. He gets out and runs into the kitchen. Um, and there's a lot of commotion and misunderstanding um, and plus, they can't understand him, and he can understand them, but they can't understand him. So his father comes in, Gregor's father, and um, thinks that Gregor is attacking the mother. He's not. So the father throws apples at Gregor, and one sinks into his roach back and remains lodged there, and then Gregor 
retreats to his bedroom but is severely injured. In fact, he will eventually die from this wound from his father. Um, <laughs> so, again, this uneasy relationship begins to develop and so they sometimes leave the bedroom door open at night so that he can watch them, uh, so that Gregor can watch his family. And this is a kind, it's meant as a kind gesture, but it actually becomes a kind of torture because he sees his family deteriorating in front of his roach eyes um, because they're going into poverty and they don't know what to do. And here, uh, Greta turns on him, uh, his only or his main advocate. Uh, she resents feeding him. She hardly cleans his room anymore. Um, they take on boarders, uh, renters, to try to, to make some money. Um, and then you, you can see what's going to happen, right? So the, one day the, there's a new cleaning lady, and she leaves the door open by accident. And the boarders are setting, sitting around in the living room. <clears throat> and Greta has been asked to play the violin for them. So you have this beautiful scene, right? You have the renters in the family room, the living room. And Greta, the young sister, is playing her violin. Gregor is entranced. He's enthralled. And he forgets himself for a moment. And he walks out into the living room. Or crawls out into the living room. One of the boarders spots Gregor and everybody freaks out uh, as they would. Gregor's father tries to say, get back in your rooms, it's all right, but they're like, you didn't tell me there were roaches here. Um, uh, we're, gonna pay, we're gonna move out immediately and we're not paying you rent. Um, Greta eventually tells her parents that they must kill Gregor or they're all going to be ruined, and the father agrees. And his only wish is that Gregor could understand and leave on his own accord. Um, in fact, he does understand, and he shrinks back into the bedroom uh, and dies. Um, upon discovering that Gregor, their son and brother, is dead, the family is, well, they're greatly relieved. The father kicks out the boarders and decides to fire the cleaning lady who left the door open. Uh, but first he asks her to dispose of Gregor's body. The family takes a trolley ride out to the countryside during which they consider their finances. Months of spare living as a result of Gregor's condition have left them with substantial savings. They decide to move to a better apartment. Greta appears to have her strength and beauty back, which leads her parents to thinking about finding her a husband. The end. Um, so, yes, he finally dies. This is an amazing story uh, about many things, but also about what work, meaningless work, does to you. It turns you into a roach. It alienates you from your family. Work of this kind actually ends up making you more impoverished than wealthy or even sustainable. Um, and that is the metamorphosis. There, there's another, of course, there are many interpretations. One is, of course, what happens to your family when you change. You know, it's about growing up in a way. It's about becoming free of the bonds that your family has placed on you. And they always do, and they do so lovingly. But you must change. You must metamorphosize. Well, tonight, I mean, that's, an, that's amazing. And you may know that story already. But tonight, I wanted to introduce you, if you don't know them, to his parables and paradoxes. Because here, for me, is Kafka at his most brilliant. And um, I wanted you to see, before we delve into these parables, um, just what a parable is. And so I always like to use etymology to figure out what's happening here. So you can read all that, but look, to, look at the bottom. So um, from para, alongside, 
that's a Greek word, a preposition alongside, and bole, a throwing, a casting, a beam, or a ray, to throw alongside, or a ray that runs alongside. It's related to the Greek word sin, bolein, balein, to throw together, right? So a symbol brings things together. This thing and that thing, which would otherwise never have any relationship, a symbol says yes. This, like bread in Christ, like why would that? This has nothing to do with that until you make it a symbol and you enact and enliven that symbol through ritual. So a parable is kind of the opposite of that, right? I mean, there's a, there's a resonance between the two things, but they, the parable runs alongside the thing. It's not going to let you make a connection easily, right? A symbol means... The prefix is together, S-Y-N, together. So you want to make that connection. That's what you're supposed to do with the symbol. With the parable, you're supposed to be confused, right? Because it's one thing running alongside another, and they're not related. You have to make the connection. This is probably, I think it's right to say, that the form of teaching that Jesus used more than anything and this accounts for his disciples being stupid uh, as they were. They, they don't understand. And at one point, I forget where this is, at one point they say, uh, you know, are you always going to talk like this? Like, are you always going to use parables? Because we're getting kind of sick of this. We don't know what the hell you're talking about. And I, I forget, somebody may know, but there's, I think Jesus says, like, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, I won't need parables. And yeah, that sounds right. All right, parables. All right, let's get into it. So, the opening of paradoxes and parables is a parable, of course. Many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, which is the only life we have. See, they run alongside each other. When the sage says, go over... He does not mean that we should cross over to some actual place, which we could not do anyhow if the labor were worth, sorry, which we could do anyhow, go over there. We could do that anyhow if it was worth it to us. So that's not anything special. He means some fabulous yonder, something unknown to us, something too that he cannot designate more precisely and therefore cannot help us here in the very least. All these parables really set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible. And we know that already. But the cares we have to struggle with every day, that is a different matter. Concerning this, a man once said, why such reluctance? If you only followed the parables, you yourselves would become parables. And with that, Rid yourself of all your daily cares. Become parables. Another said, I bet that's also a parable. And another said, and the first said, you have won. And the second said, but unfortunately, only in parable. And the first said, no, in reality, you have won in reality. In parable, you have lost. I think I'm just going to let that sit there. I'll let all these sit here and we'll come back to them in the discussion. See if you can pick up the themes here. Uh, I like this. I like them all. This is so cool. An imperial message. So, just, just the craft of language here. Just listen. The imperial, uh, <laughs> the imperial, the emperor. So it runs, has sent a message to you, the humble subject, the insignificant shadow cowering in the remotest distance before the imperial sun. You, the emperor, has sent a message to you. The emperor from his deathbed has sent a message to you alone. He has commanded the messenger to kneel down by the bed, and he has whispered the message to him. 
So much store did he lay on it that he ordered the messenger to whisper it back to him into his ear. This is a very important message. Then by a nod of the head, he confirmed, the emperor confirmed that the message was right. And yes, before the assembled spectators of his death, all the obstructing walls have been broken down and on the spacious and lofty mounting open staircases stand in a ring the great princes of the empire. Before all these, the emperor has delivered his message to the messenger. The messenger immediately sets out on his journey, a powerful, indefatigable, indefatigable man, now pushing with his right arm, now with his left, he cleaves away for himself through the throng. If he encounters resistance, he points to his breast where the symbol of the sun glitters. The way, too, is made easier for him than it would be for any other man. He is the messenger of the emperor. But the multitudes are so vast, their numbers have no end. If he could reach the open fields, how fast he would fly, and doubtless soon you would hear the welcome hammering of his fists on your door. But instead, how vainly does he wear out his strength? Still, he is only making his way through the chambers of the innermost palace. He's gone nowhere. Never will he get to the end of the palace and its chambers. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained because he must fight his way down the next stair. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. The courts would still have to be crossed. And after the courts, the second outer palace, and once more the stairs and the courts, and once more another palace, and so on for thousands of years. And if at last this messenger should burst through the outermost gate of the king's castle, but never, never can that happen, the imperial capital would lie before him, the center of the world, crammed to bursting with its own refuse. Nobody could fight his way through here. Least of all, one with a message from a dead man. But you sit at your window when the evening falls and dream it to yourself. I, I don't even want to comment on this. I mean, we will, to be sure. But You sit at your window when evening falls and you dream it to yourself. This message, this impossible message. Here's a parable that is kind of a prelude to the trial, uh, the novel, The Trial. Before the law stands a doorkeeper on guard. To this doorkeeper, there comes a man from the country who begs for admittance to the law, capital L, the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot admit the man at the moment. The man, on reflection, asks if he will be allowed then to enter later to the law. It is possible, answers the doorkeeper, but not right now. Since the door leading into the law stands open as usual, the doorkeeper and the doorkeeper steps to one side, the man bends down to peer through the entrance to the law. When the doorkeeper sees that, he laughs. And he says, if you're so tempted, try to get in without my permission to the law. But note that I am powerful, and I am only the lowest doorkeeper. From hall to hall, keepers stand at every door, one more powerful than another. Even a third of these men have an aspect, a, an expression, an appearance that even I cannot bear to look at. These are difficulties which the man from the country is not expected to meet. The law, he thinks, should be accessible to every person and at all times. But when he looks more closely at the doorkeeper in his furred robe, his huge pointed nose and his long, thin, tartar beard, he decides he'd better wait to get permission to enter the law. The doorkeeper gives him a stool 
and lets him sit down beside the door. There he sits waiting for days and years. He makes many attempts to be allowed in and wearies the doorkeeper with his persistence. The doorkeeper often engages him in brief conversation, asking him about his home and other matters. But the questions are put quite impersonally, as great men put questions, and always conclude with the statement that the man cannot be allowed to enter yet. The man who has equipped himself with many things for this journey parts with all he has, however valuable, in hope of bribing the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper accepts the man's bribes, saying, however, as he takes each gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. <laughs> During all these long years, the man watches the doorkeeper incessantly. He forgets about the other doorkeepers, and this one seems to him the only barrier between himself and the law. In the first years, he curses his evil fate aloud. Later, as he grows old, he only mutters to himself. He grows childish. And since in his prolonged watch, he has learned to know even the fleas in the doorkeeper's fur collar, he begs the very fleas to help him and to persuade the doorkeeper to change his mind. Finally, his eyes grow dim, and he does not know whether the world is really darkening around him or whether his eyes are only deceiving him. But in the darkness, he can now perceive a radiance that streams immorally from the door of the law. Now his life is drawing to a close. Before he dies, all that he had experienced during the whole of his sojourn condenses in his mind into one question, which he had never yet put to the doorkeeper. He beckons the doorkeeper, since he can no longer raise his stiffening body. The doorkeeper has to bend far down to hear him, for the difference in size between them has increased very much to the man's disadvantage. What do you want to know now? asked the doorkeeper. You're insatiable. Everyone strives to attain the law, answers the man. How does it come about then that in all these years, no one else came to ask to be admitted to the law. Just me. The doorkeeper perceives that the man is at the end of his strength and that his hearing is failing, so he bellows in his ear. No one but you could gain admittance through this door, since this door was intended only for you. And now I am going to shut it. I know. <laughs> now, that's not the end of the parable. It actually goes on and on and on as a man named Kay uh, is asking a priest about this story. And they go back and forth, and, and they, it's, it's Rashomon. It's like every possible interpretation is made where the doorkeeper is evil, where the doorkeeper is good. Uh, where the man is evil and not evil. It, they go through, and if, if you've studied the Hebrew Bible or been to temple, you know this mode of expression and interpretation. It's midrash. It's the rabbinical interpretation of a text from the Hebrew Bible. If you look at Hebrew Bibles um, as they've come down to us, you'll see in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then you'll see Rabbi Zev say, well, this means this, writing in the margins. And then Rabbi Tova will come by later and say, no, I think it means this, and here's why, because we read over here about this. And so this amazing thing happens with this holy text as it gets supplemented and supplemented and supplemented through Midrash. See, this excessive audacious interpretation. This is Kafka's Jewishness uh, coming out. <clears throat> um, and, and that's what this is. It's a uh, contemporary midrash of a story. Um, the, while we're on this, there's another Jewish element to Kafka's work here that you will recognize if you know anything about Jewish literature, and that is the wisdom tradition. 
So the wisdom tradition, it's part of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, uh, which comes across as, to us as the law, the prophets, and the writings. So you know who the prophets are, and the law is the Torah. But what are the writings? The writings are, among other things, or in part, the wisdom tradition. And the wisdom tradition is brutal. It's parabolic. It's, it's Job. The wisdom tradition is the book of Job, where Job does nothing wrong. In fact, he does everything right. Job does not sin. But God, in a poker game with Satan, decides to mess with Job. All right? There is no rationale for this. There is no theological justification for this. As I told a group of students once, if you don't read Job and see God as a son of a bitch, you haven't read the book. It's brutal. And forgive me if I repeat myself when I talk about Job, but the book of Job does not end the way you think it does. Uh, it ends with the line, and therefore Job was comforted that he was dust. That's the wisdom tradition. Right? Now, later editors will come along and give Job back his children and his cattle because, yeah, that's fine. I lost those children, but I'll take these. Plus, I got more cattle. So how bad is it? Um, that's crap. That's not the story. That's not the wisdom tradition. <clears throat> Another story from the wisdom tradition is, uh, let me see if I can remember this. Right, so they're in a little village. Yes, and a child gets stuck in the well. A little boy is playing around. He falls into the well. And so uh, he's about to drown. And so the village comes together, and they say, what can we do? What can we do? And somebody gets the bright idea to, and remembers that the well is fed by a spring. And so they run up to the spring, and they dam up the spring. And then the water stops rising in the well, and they can get down in there and rescue the child. And the village died of thirst. I know, but that's the wisdom tradition. Uh, that's Kafka, too. All right. Oh, the watchman. These are so good. I ran past the first watchman. Then I was horrified and ran back and said to the watchman, I ran through here while you were looking the other way. <laughs> the watchman gazed ahead of him and said nothing. I suppose I really oughtn't to have done it, I said. The watchman said nothing. Does your silence indicate permission to pass? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Kafka is on the faceless bureaucracies that we live with every day, whether it's work or you don't have a boss who loves you. <laughs> Just a faceless boss that looks and, and mumbles uh, mystic sayings. No wonder the Kafka became so popular among the resistance to communism in Eastern Europe. Um, this is, by the way, there's a um, French theorist who I think really captures this moment here with a concept he calls um, interpolation. This is Louis Althusser, and he talks about this very thing that Kafka is talking about, but in a much less interesting way, theoretical way. But he's talking about ideology and the state, and he says, um, this is how ideology works. It, in fact, he says, this is how ideology works to constitute you as a subject, right? So not, not like, you know, there's you and then there's a state and there's this war. No, it's that the state is creating your identity as a subject and you are a subject, not as a free and open subject, but you're a subject of the state and by the state. And he says, you know this, you can see this at work when you're walking down the street and a cop says, hey, you. And you turn around. How do you know that the you is you? 
Or if you're going down the freeway and the cop comes up behind you and you think that's for you. Uh, I did a lot of trips with students, and uh, I remember once, it was actually our first trip, we were at White Sands Missile Range, and I've got eight college students in the van, we're camping, and uh, we're, we're coming across White Sands Missile Range, and uh, there's a roadblock, and I'm like, hey guys, I don't know what's going on, but you know, you might want to get rid of your stash, <laughs> and I look at the rear view mirror, and they're like, and then I see stuff start going out of the van. I'm like, okay, I was kidding, but <laughs> turns out they were doing a test fire of the missile, but they lost their stash. <laughs> oh my God, I miss those days. There was one night uh, we were camping in New Mexico. It was like minus eight, snow everywhere. The first thing I would do is get up first thing I would do is turn on the vans to get some heat, and then I would read a passage from Whitman's Song of the Open Road. But before I got to the, to the, pass, to the, uh, yeah, to the passage, I turned on the van, everybody climbs into the van, <clears throat> snowing, wipers are going back and forth. Two female students are like, whoa, they're watching the wipers. I'm like, what are you doing? You, are you tripping? <laughs> So one of their requirements was to write a journal. So I read the journal at the end of the trip, and they're like, I can't believe you knew we dropped acid. <laughs> I'm like, well, I didn't until just now, but brilliant. <laughs> Poseidon, poor Poseidon. He's got one of these jobs. Poseidon sat at his desk doing figures. <laughs> The administration of all the waters gave him endless work. He could have had assistants as many as he wanted, and he did have very many, but since he took his job very seriously, he would, go, he would in the end go over all the figured calculations himself. And thus his assistants were of little help to him. He did not know how to delegate, we would say. It cannot be said that he enjoyed his work. He did it only because it had been assigned to him. There is so much wisdom here. Uh, in fact, he had already filed many petitions for, as he put it, more cheerful work. But every time the offer of something different was made to him, it turned out that nothing, nothing suited him quite as well oh, wait, as his present position. And anyhow, it was quite difficult to find something different for him. Thank you, Wes. After all, it was impossible to assign him to a particular C, <laughs> aside from the fact that even then the work with figures would not grow less but only pettier. The great Poseidon could in any case occupy only an executive position. And when a job away from the water was offered to him, he would get sick at the very prospect. His divine breathing would become troubled and his brazen chest began to tremble. Besides, his, his complaints were not really taken seriously. When one of the mighty is vexatious, the appearance of an effort must be made to placate him, even when the case is most hopeless. In actuality, a shift of posts was unthinkable for Poseidon. He had been appointed god of the sea in the beginning, and there he had to remain. What irritated him the most, <laughs> And, this, and it was this that was chiefly responsible for his dissatisfaction with his job, was to hear of the conceptions people formed of him. How he was always riding through the ways with his trident. When all the while he sat here in the depths of the world ocean, doing figures uninterruptedly, with now and then a trip to Jupiter as the only break in the monotony. A trip Moreover, from which, from which he usually returned in a rage. Thus he had hardly, because he was seeing Zeus, thus he had hardly seen the sea. Had seen it, but fleetingly in the course of hurried ascents to Olympus. And he had never actually traveled around the sea. He was in the habit of saying that what he was waiting for was the fall of the world. Then, probably, a quiet moment 
would yet be granted in which just before the end and after having checked the last row of figures, he would be able to make a quick little tour. Poseidon became bored with the sea. He let fall his trident. Silently, he sat on the rocky coast and a gull, dazed by his presence, described wavering circles around his head. The vulture. Oh my God, these are so good. Um, the vulture was hacking at my feet. It had already torn my boots and stockings to shreds. Now it was hacking at the feet themselves. Again and again, it struck at them, then circled several times restlessly around me, then returned to continue its work. A gentleman passed by, looked for a while, then asked me why I suffered the vulture. I'm helpless, I said. When it, was, when it came and began to attack me, of course, I tried to drive it away, even to strangle it, but these animals are very strong. And it was about to spring at my face, but I preferred to sacrifice my feet. Now they're almost torn to bits. Fancy letting yourself be tortured like this, said the gentleman. One shot, and it's the end of the vulture. Really? I said, with pleasure, said the gentleman. I've only got to go home and get my gun. Could you wait a half an hour? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure about that, said I, and stood for a moment rigid with pain. Then I said, do try it in any case, please. Very well, said the gentleman. I'll be as quick as I can. During this conversation, the vulture had been calmly listening, letting his eye rove between me and the gentleman. Now I realized that it had understood everything. It took wing leaned far back to gain impetus, and then, like a javelin thrower, thrust its beak into my mouth, deep into me. Falling back, I was relieved to feel him drowning irretrievably in my blood, which was filling every depth, flooding every shore. Whoa. I know. <laughs> I just don't even want to say anything. It's too beautifully constructed. But we will. <laughs> the couriers, they were offered the choice between becoming kings or the couriers of the king. Couriers of kings. The way children would, they all wanted to be couriers. Therefore, there are only couriers who hurry about the world shouting to each other, since they are, there are no kings. Messages that have become meaningless. They would like to put an end to this miserable life of theirs, but they dare not because of their oaths of service. That is Franz Kafka on Twitter. <laughs> and here again is our passage. Leopards break into the temple and drink to the dregs what is in the sacrificial pitchers. This is repeated over and over again. Finally, it can be calculated in advance and it becomes part of the ceremony. Thank you for your attention.